Hi, my name is Mitra Manesh. I'm a servant. I serve through teaching, coaching, consulting, or any other way that I can find to share what I know with those who want to know. And this Lights On podcast is one of those ways. It was created with consciousness and mindful living in heart. So join us as we travel through many roads of learning and transformation together. And if you enjoy our podcast, please give us feedback by rating us five star and share us with others if you think they may benefit from it. On behalf of my team, I thank you for your presence. This episode is the continuation of an interview that Noor Tahani from Goodness Podcast had with me. And we are talking about mindful couplehood in these challenging times. Again, it's a little bit longer than normal. So relax, take a drink. Maybe you want to get your cup of tea. And let's enjoy the conversation because Noor has an amazing way of asking questions and and the curiosity that she had brought many different interesting answers in me. Let's take a listen together. Welcome to the Goodness Podcast, the Middle East's first platform dedicated to tackling women's health in a real and honest way. I'm your host, Noor Tahini. Welcome to part two of my chat with Mitra Manesh, mindfulness thought leader, storyteller, and educator. If you missed part one, check out episode 78 of the Goodness Podcast, where we discuss the impact that the pandemic has had on our perception of reality and how to use the science of mindfulness to navigate anxiety. In part two, Mitra hones in on the impact that this pandemic has had on our romantic relationships and how to use the science of mindfulness to mitigate that. So the pandemic has been hard on everyone from older generations who have been separated from their families who are in nursing home all the way to young children who are having to sort of bypass normal socialization and stay at home and and learn from home. It's been particularly difficult on couples and relationships. Oh, yes. Um, I've never had so many couple sessions and I've never had so many couples coming to offerings that I have together. And the reason for that is to be very honest with you, these issues existed before, but we were busying ourselves. So there was a chocolate cover on them. Mm -hmm. So none of the issues that I hear from my clients and people that I work with deeply are new, none of them. We were so busy. We had lives that we said goodbye in the morning and then we came out, you know, we came back at night and we went out again. And there was social life and there were restaurants and there were social engagements and and they were covered. Nothing is new. It is showing itself in a new way. Mm -hmm. Now I am at home with my spouse, with my families and family members. And then I realized, oh, my God, this this was missing. I can't believe they do that. And I can't. There is no escape. So that's the first thing I want to say, because people think that things have gone bad. No, bad things, problems have shown themselves to us now. Have surfaced, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And that's that's a very important part of the solution. The solution is then now we are forced to see what was hidden before. And we are forced to work on them. Before we dive into the solution, you said something. You said that... So the, the distraction or the, the shock, chocolate covering has been taken away and we're now stuck at home with the issues that have always been there, but without that sort of separation that was between us and them, without the escapes, the various escapes that we had. But my question is, is it natural for that to happen or is it is it in a relationship? Are you supposed to be so in each other's faces, so devoid of other distractions or in fact, for relationships to work, do you need the distractions? Do you need the ability to like clock, clock out in the morning and then come back at night and have the ability to go out and see your friends when you need a break, etc.? What, what is the natural environment for a relationship? Very good question. Very deep question. 
Uh, it's not the distractions that we need. It's the space from each other that we need. And that doesn't need distractions. I could be in the same room, and sometimes I am, with my spouse, but we still create space. So it's the space that we need because most of us recharge on our own. And when I am in your space, doesn't matter who I am to you, all the time, you don't have the opportunity to recharge yourself. Hence, you are really going on reserve. That's why you get upset with me. But I want to say that the distractions maybe were not the healthiest thing to have in order to create space. We can actually naturally, in a very civil way, before we go at each other's neck, create that space. In fact, we can have a communication coming to the main tool for a healthier relationship is to communicate that need and, and really recognize and request that. Most of the time when I work with, with couples, it's very interesting. They, they assume the other person knows. And it's funny, me as a professional that doesn't you know, live with them, I know far more about them than their spouses know. Why? Because I'm observing them in a different way. And we can't leave that to guesswork. I can't expect my spouse to know what my needs. So the process that I would like to suggest is the process of really identification of one's needs and two, the communication of that to their spouse. So I know something is happening. There is a whole formula to it. I identify the fact. The fact is I'm getting really, you know, there's something not right. That's the fact. I don't even know what it is. Something is not right. Okay. I go to myself and I say, what am I feeling? Oh, whatever. It's just name it. I'm feeling upset. I'm, I'm feeling tight. I'm feeling provoked. Whatever the feeling is. The next question, what is my need? Ah, oh, what am I feeling? What am I needing? Okay. My need right now, and usually needs are so simple, Noor. They're so simple. Very rarely my need is to move to Paris. It's like, I need space, I need fresh air. I need just a cup of warm water and a little bit of alone time. I need to recharge, that's what I need. Oh, great, Petra, bravo for knowing that. And now, it, there it comes, the key to a healthy relationship. What is my request to my spouse? Request, not a demand, not a fight, not you always do this, I never do that, like, no. We're doing it in a timely manner. I'm connected to myself. And then I can ask, I would like to go for a walk on my own. I, may I have some time alone? I feel like I need to be charged. May I, may you, would you be willing to? Whatever the request is. And that is prevention. But when I don't know what I'm feeling, when I don't know what I'm needing, when I don't ask and request what I want, it goes to a place that it's gone to overdrive. And now I find myself really suffocating. And my spouse says the smallest thing that is wrong. And I lose it with him. And I go to, you never do this. I always am feeling like I, I go to a land that is hard to come back. It needs many, many days to come back to zero. I've gone to minus now. So connection with self identification of the need and then the request before it gets to explosion is the key to a healthy relationship. Mm. And yes, you are right, No, We do need spaces. We, knew, we need distance to really recharge, but it doesn't need to be at the price of our intimacy or respect or togetherness. In this particular example that you've given or the particular like scenario that you've built, there is tension building and then one of the partner needs space in order to be able to diffuse, reconnect to what their need is and be able to put in a request. But there's a specific uh, case that I'm thinking of, a friend of mine who who has been married for a while, has children. And through distractions and 
you know, a full-time job and traveling and a very full social life, has been able to ignore certain aspects of her partner, has been able to kind of distract herself from them. But now she is, you know, stuck in the same home all the time, face to face, not anymore because we're not on lockdown anymore, but for a while we were. And she was forced to face these aspects of her husband that she doesn't like at all and that she actually doesn't want in a partner. And I don't think that it's simply a case of, you know, reconnecting with herself and, and giving herself space, etc., because this is something that she that is actually really problematic for her. Um, and I and I think that what COVID did in removing all of the distractions, it, it removed her coping mechanisms. Have you seen cases like this? Yes. It didn't re- remove her coping mechanism. It removed her cover-ups. And yeah. you said right words. You used very right words. You said she had ignored, not accepted, mm. ignored the shortcomings that were really of importance to her. And in that case, we're talking about an extreme case Mm -hmm. that she's in a position that she has really recognized and no longer can deny the fact that there are traits and and things about her partner that she cannot live with. Is that that extreme? Am I correct in assuming that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now there is the fork that we're standing and many of us had to do that. The, The question is, do I accept the shortcomings for the time being, at least right, if she has children, or do I take a different road and go there? But but this is a too much of an extreme question. True. My question to this person would be, have you really utilized all the tools possible? Because most people have not examined that. And if I tell you how many people have come to me and said, I'm ready to call it, you know, a day and just say, sorry, you know, let's go. Um, no longer a mm-hmm. partner for me. And I said, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you tried this? Have you done this? Have you worked on this? Like there were five major areas that they hadn't really explored. Of course, some of it, we can do it on our own. Some of it, we need the collaboration of our partner or our spouse. And that's the extreme question I was, mm-hmm. I was posing. I'm asking to ask you to ask her, please exhaust all the other options first before you go to that mm-hmm. option because, and attend to your own needs as much as you can. Because if she is in that place that she's communicating to you these issues to this severity and, and extreme, then that means maybe she hasn't taken care of her own needs to a degree yeah. that she Yeah, so, she reached a breaking so, point. Yeah, exactly. So, one suggestion attend to your needs as much as you can. This is for your friend. And second one is from that place of of a little bit of balance and fulfillment, self at least fulfillment, Mm -hmm. then ask yourself, what are other ways that I can do alone or with my spouse? And then the third option is always available to everybody. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be in a mindful relationship? So kind of applying what what you said earlier, about mindfulness does it mean to be in a relationship where you you know you're compassionate towards yourself and your partner you're connected to what your needs are you're listening to what your needs are in this moment to what your partner's needs are in this moment how else would you describe it yeah so let's go through the five elements and i give you examples of a mindful relationship and unmindful relationship so the first one was awareness so if i tell you how many couples have no idea how bad the other uh, other partner is experiencing their partnership. So awareness of their own behavior and awareness of what's going on. And you may say, how do we become aware? Where self-awareness is easy, you connect to yourself. So when I say things and are hurtful and I have no idea, everybody in the room gets it except me, that I'm hurting my partner, that's lack of awareness. Mm. That's lack of awareness. And Awareness is that, oh, I said something and oh, I saw it on, on his face and I, I can go and say, honey, did, did that bother you when I said that? And he says, yes. And I say, I'm so sorry. It, it just wasn't present to that. That's awareness. The second one was acceptance. 
There are so many things that we do not see when we are in the romantic and honeymoon part of our relationship because we're only seeing what's right. And now that we live together, we're looking at what's wrong that we need to accept and let go of that perfect idea, illusion of a partner that they have in mind. Perfect doesn't exist. Perfect is probably for angels who don't live on this planet, but you are not perfect, I am not perfect, and neither are our partners. Accepting that it will not be per perfect. And then asking for the change in where it's possible. So acceptance, you said she was ignoring, I would suggest, that we need to accept. I accept that my partner has these things, my spouse does these things, and these are things that I probably won't see any change in, in, in him for the rest of our mm -hmm. partnership. And the next one is presence. Most of the time, we're not there. We're just not there. Now, there are so many equipments to take us away from here. The TV is on and it's loud. My telephone, I'm on it and I'm checking social media. I'm not even present to what's happening. And one of the things that it's, oh, I get emotional when I think about this. I was working with a couple and I usually ask them to ask each other, give one commitment of change and ask for one, you know, request one change in the partner. And one of the partners just asked and said, I just want you to be there when you're there. That's it. And, and, and he started crying. He said, what do you mean? She said, I never have you. Your staff have you more than I do. Your partners at work have you more than I do. Your secretary has you more than I do. I never have you. You're either at work or working from home. I want you to be present for half an hour. Have a cup of tea with me. Look at my eyes. Ask me how I'm doing. That's all she wants. You would think she would ask, and he's a very, very you know, famous person. You would think she would ask for the biggest diamond in the world. And she said, be there when you're there. Be with me when you're there. So presence. And then curious about ways, going to the fourth aspect of, of mindfulness. Curious. Is there another way? Because we usually judge instead of being curious. Judgment is curiosity gone wrong? Instead of me asking, no, tell me, how do you do this? Like what you're doing, curiosity, you're asking me, I'm judging you. I think you don't do this. I think you always do that. I have like my own illusionary, usually conclusion about people without giving you a chance and get asking you, even with your kids, ask instead of tell. Is there a better way? Could you please, would you consider do you know this? Ask. Be curious to hear the answer and provoke the curiosity in your partner and see if he or she can also go to the curious land and curious space and do all of this with a sense of compassion because we are all hurting. We are all trying to do better and sometimes we can't. There is no like horrible person unless you're living with a criminal and married a criminal. We are all human beings trying to do better and getting lost in the way. Hence compassion. Which is the fifth one. Yes, yeah. exactly. It, I, I read something once that said, we're all just wounded children going about life. And it's so exactly. true. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And when we have real collusion, is when my hurt child meets my partner's hurt child and then they just both don't know what to do. They yeah. do what they know what to do, which is either escape, attack, or defend. These are the three things we do when we go to the hurt child. That's what we learned. That's the only thing we knew. Either we would go and hide in the closet or we would start saying, you idiot, you this, and we go there, attack. Or we somehow defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. We will go quiet. We will go silent. We go with needless. We yeah, cover we our retreats. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. These are the things we know what to do. And you know what, No, Most of us emotionally are under seven. <laughs> unless we have done work. I'm not, I'm not even being sarcastic, yeah. honestly. With all of my compassion... And with all of observation of 36 years in this 
arena of mindfulness on four continents. And it's not like I'm just like got it like a sample of one, one place, working with many cultures, being from the East and being living in the West and working with all people from different backgrounds. I have seen that most of us emotionally are under seven unless they've done some work. Yeah. And I think to to kind of bring together what you're saying, doing the work personally is is almost like um, a sixth element, maybe not a sixth element to mindfulness, but it's like a sixth ingredient to making relationships work in a time like this. Wise action. You were right. The sixth mm-hmm. element is wise action. So that now that I know better, now that I'm aware now that I'm present, now that I've accepted that which I cannot change, now that I'm truly curious about solutions and choice, now that I've held myself, you, and the world with compassion, what is the wisest action? I wonder, what is the wisest action I can take? And sometimes the wisest action is to just contemplate and just see what's happening inside of me. Sometimes wisest action is to just buy some time and say, you know, this is not a right time. I'm provoked. You're provoked. Can we just take this on mm-hmm. like later? Mm-hmm. That's just that. That completely is water on, on that fire. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. now. This is not a good time. Can we just take it up like when I'm more comfortable? Mm-hmm. Anything else that you feel like we should cover for mindful relationships that we haven't? Yes. And that is that we are always in a threesome relationship when we are in a relationship with one person. Interesting. And (laughs) I know that's a very (laughs) sexy statement to make, but it's not sexy at all. It's what is really determining my relationship with my partner is my relationship with my creator. And when I am strong in my relationship with my creator, with with the universe, whatever you want to call it, and it's not about religion, really. It's about understanding that there is a belief that is really dictating and, and commanding my relationship, the essence of my relationship. Really checking that and seeing if we can make that a bit healthier and stronger and see if that relationship can, can guide me better and in a more healthier way. When you say my creator, you mean it's, it's, it's your relationship with, I mean, with spirituality, whether it's religion or whatever your spiritual belief is, your relationship with the, with the universe or whatever, however yes. you, you perceive life to be, basically, your values exactly. and understanding in that sense. Absolutely. And when, when I really check that, and when I make that stronger and more clear for myself, then I can live with my values because most of the problems are the fact that we either are not clear about our values or we're not living by our values. And that's what is really driving this you know, relationship that, mm-hmm. that we have with somebody else. So check that because that's in my commands, that, that I can have a yeah. say in. And if I say, and if I really believe that we are all, you know, we all have shortcomings. We're all children of the same parent. We are all struggling. That I can't see other people like enemies and like less than human and hate them the way I do or attack them the way I do or see them the way I do. So checking that is, it's a triangle. There's always triangles of relationship, yeah. even though there might be two people. It's so interesting to hear that because I've, I've, had many um, relationship therapists, couples therapists, et cetera, on the show, and I've never heard that. And I'm thinking about it as you're talking, my mind is trying to find examples for it to make sense for me. And I guess the first thing that came to my mind is, so I'm raised, I'm, I was raised Christian. I was born to Christian parents. I, you know, went to, went to, to church, to Sunday school, which actually wasn't on a Sunday because I was living in the UAE because uh, I was growing up in the UAE. <laughs> on Fridays. Yeah. I go to church, you know, and, and, if I had to try and uh, apply this triangle you spoke of, for example, in my case or my religion or my relationship, it would be the 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 belief and the teachings that I learned from my religion, which is, you know, forgiveness and compassion. If I truly believe in the teachings of my religion, and that is 
and and I I really want to embody the values that it teaches me, then how can I not extend forgiveness and compassion to my partner? Thank you. You made my work easy. Exactly that. <laughs> I'm, I'm connecting you with that which is within you. Mm-hmm. And as I said, it's, it's irrelevant to me what it is because that's your yeah. belief. But you've gone back home to your belief. Or, or somebody may say, Mitra, I was born out of whatever and I don't believe in it. That's okay. That's fine. I'm, I'm not here to convert you to your religion. Mm-hmm. What is your belief? What do you yeah. believe? Oh, I believe in humanity. Oh, great. That's why I didn't call it God, because yeah, some exactly. people may not call it God. I called it your relationship with the universe. You have something that is guiding your life. Go back to that, ascertain what is there, what will be helpful, bring it into this relationship. Because on autopilot, when we are not aware, usually that wonderful belief that we have has no say in our relationship. Mm. And I'm saying it needs to have a say. If I believe it, I need to bring it in. If I believe in humanity, if I believe in justice, I was a human rights commissioner for many years, then where is justice in my relationship? Is it showing up? And I'm not even, that's not even a religion. Justice, okay. Fairness, great. Is Does it have a place in my relationship? Um, I don't know. Maybe I need to work on that. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. That's why your beliefs, your faith, your religion, your relationship with the universe, whatever you want to call it. And I don't want to limit it. Yeah, of course. That needs to have a place in your relationship. That needs to go. You need to go to your roots and say, yes, compassion. I come from a school of thought, a religion that says, love thy neighbor. Can I, if I, how can I not love, and I don't mean love in a romantic way, not love my partner when I'm loving my neighbor? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why can I not bring those principles and allow that to live in my home with me and my partner? Yeah, super interesting. Super interesting. Thank you so much, Mitra. It was such a pleasure talking to you. Of course. Same here. Pleasure was mine. And thank you for your curiosity and your questions. Thanks for listening today. If you're not familiar with goodness, head to www.goodness.me to access the online platform and articles and follow us at goodness on Instagram. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review and share it. And we'll see you next week. Hope this episode answered the question or two for you or provoked and inspired questions in you. I'm so grateful you showed up and listened up. Until the next time, be well and stay curious.